Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Kate Reavy, and I'm the instructor for this course, General Studies 121, also Studium Generale, which is a gift to the community. And we're grateful that you're here, and I want to make sure to thank the generous donors to the Peninsula College Foundation who help extend the opportunities for these kinds of programs. We're really, really grateful to you. And now I'd like to ask Sadie Crow to introduce our program. Thank you, Kate. Hello, everyone. I'm Sadie Crow, the steward for Acoustinout House of Learning Peninsula College Longhouse, um, which is on traditional Nusqualam lands and named by tribal elders in the Clallam language. Acoustinout means house of learning, and it is a place where we teach, learn, and share our cultures, our traditions, our identities. It is a place where we celebrate our unique differences and our diversity. The vision of the Longhouse to be a center for cultural expression and educational achievement was woven together by the college and six sovereign nations on the Olympic Peninsula, the Ho tribe, the Quileute tribe, the Macaw tribe, the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe, the Jamestown Sklalem tribe, and the Lower Awaklalem tribe. We are grateful to today's honored guest, Karen Sixkiller, and for sharing her artwork in Acoustinout. Karen will introduce herself as she would like to in just a moment, but I wanted to take this opportunity to invite all of you to join us in Acoustinout following today's presentation and to see Karen Sixkiller's exhibit, Cherokee Grandmother Spider. Thank you all for being here. Karen. Hello, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Karen Sixkiller. My presentation is called Rediscovering Grandma Spider. And let's see, I, I have a little laser pointer. In the corner of this slide is her name in the Cherokee language. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I believe it's Distoldi is her actual name um, in Cherokee. So, the presentation is about my artistic process in creating a sculpture named Ember. Um, the sculpture is seven feet, four inches high. There's slightly more height um, below ground for mounting. Um, about two and a half feet wide and two and a half feet deep. You can see it, oops, oops, wrong, wrong button. There we go. You can see it in this photo um, proportionate to, to people. There's a bronze spider in the sculpture which is on a steel base, and it's currently installed at the Port Angeles Fine Arts Center through June of 2023. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the, and I'm gonna mispronounce this, Nisk Lilum, Nisk Lilum, um, or Klalum Sklalum people, and I would like to please uh, pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Also, Wado, thank you to Kate Reavy, who coordinated the Studium General Forum, to Ty Tim Bryce up in the um, AVIT center up there, um, to Sadie Crow, the steward at Acoustinal um, House of Learning here on Peninsula College, to Steve Bells, who is an art department faculty here and my mentor through independent study credits. Um, he made the creation of the sculpture possible, as well as Kelly Flanagan, who's co-director of the welding department here. He helped me source steel student welders, um, fabrication, mentoring, and encouragement. And finally, I would like to put a, a heartfelt thanks to Sarah Jane, who is the former gallery director at the Port Angeles Fine Arts Center, and the person who connected me with Sadie Crow so that I could have an exhibition and the opportunity to have this presentation. Um, I wanna start with who I am and who I am not. So all of a sudden I have to put my glasses on. Uh, I'm the daughter of Ed and Sheila, Six Killer Fritz, and my mother is in the audience. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, 
born for the, the Wolf Clan, so um, th through the matrilineal line, uh, I'm a member of the Wolf Clan. I'm a contemporary Cherokee artist, and I, my artwork has been juried into the Cherokee Art Market in Tulsa and the Cherokee Homecoming Show in Tahlequah. I'm a conceptual artist, and that's defined by the Oxford Dictionary as where the idea or the concept presented by the artist is considered more important than the appearance of or execution of the object. So for example, in the background of this slide are um, my sculptures named cancer sticks. So they're beaded to look like little, little cigarettes with um, truth and advertising with their little skull and crossbones on there. Uh, and I'm a sculptural artist, so I do sculptural and functional ceramics, beadwork, and metalwork. I also consider myself an urban Indian, so someone who did not grow up on a reservation, but grew up in a city or urban environment, and someone who's trying to sort of reconnect with my culture to learn it and understand it, um, along with everything else that comes with daily life. But I am not a Cherokee or a Native American scholar. <laughs> nor am I an expert, so um, I'm not claiming those things. <laughs> Let's start with the story. Um, it's often called the spider brings fire story. So before there were people, the animals could talk and they held counsel to make decisions about their evolving world. One day the animals decided that they, would, that they wanted to tame fire for both light and warmth. They decided to capture some fire the next time lightning struck, but the world was new. There was a lot of islands, and the next time lightning struck, it was out on this island. So not just any animal could go get this fire. First the birds tried to get it, and similar to some of the local tribes, Raven was the first to try to get the fire, but in our tradition, he wasn't successful, and his beautiful white plumage came back this iridescent black. He wasn't able to get it. And different versions have different birds also try. They're always transformed. Then some snakes tried, right? They were able to swim across to this island, but they also were unsuccessful and they came back transformed in different ways. A tiny spider tried to get the council's attention, but no one wanted to listen to her, telling her that she was too small and weak to be of any help. The spider decided to try anyway. She swam across the water. She made a clay pot, or in some traditions, wove a silk basket and put it on her back. And she was able to climb up this giant rotten tree and back down inside where the smoke was smoldering, where the fire was smoldering. She put an ember into her vessel and climbed back out, swam across the water, and brought this ember to the Council of Animals. She was also transformed in this, in this endeavor in that she, has, um, she now has red markings on her arms and on her back. So not like a black widow with red markings on the underside of her abdomen, but on her back. And some traditions even say that this exact fire has been kept burning to today through the council fire. So a council fire was kept burning on the Trail of Tears and is continuously burning in Tahlequah in the capital um, city of the Cherokee Nation, and some people attribute this exact fire to this tiny ember that this spider brought, which, which is fabulous. So what's the message? Regardless of the version you find, it's always made very clear that the message is, despite being small, weak, overlooked by the others, spider changed the world forever. So never underestimate the power of the small. Well, why make a public sculpture? As someone who, um, as a Cherokee artist who's participated in high caliber artistic events, I'm on a mailing list and when opportunities for art through the tribe come up, I get solicited with all kinds of other artists. So I got an email one December, um, an open call for public art that was to be installed in a new park and pathway in downtown Tahlequah. So this in the background is a photo of the new pathway that was built. I had four months to make a detailed proposal for the commission. And Grandma Spider's story, its modern relevance of respecting and appreciating the power of the small 
was a favorite of mine. Plus the visual interest that could be, um, that could be achieved in a large public sculpture with light casting through, um, making those shadows, it was, it was compelling and it compelled me to start working on a proposal. And at this point, I knew her as Water Spider. I believed her name was Water Spider. So to start my, my artistic process, I went back to, um, to the original, like what, what's the original imagery for this, for this character? And I found um, some examples. This is from the Illinois Museum of Native Art. Um, they had these three shell gorgets. And you notice um, in their attribution, they call her water spider. Um, they date back from between 1000 and 1600 AD. And some things that I just wanted to point out is that um, they're very similar. These two are extremely similar to each other. But in every case, there's a particular proportion of the legs to the body. Um, there's this centerpiece, and in some of the research, oh, I think my laser gave out. There's this centerpiece on her body, and some of the research people who didn't consult any Cherokee people are like, oh, they didn't understand that spiders don't have three parts to their abdomen. No, that's the pot that's carrying the ember. And then another key point are these eyes on the top of her head, okay, which is also not necessarily anatomically correct for a water spider. But this started stage one of my artistic process, and I played with the ideas of how to represent the water spider character based on these original bone etchings. At first, I also wanted to include the water beetle character who's got a similar creation story. Um, he brought the land and the same kind of deal. People didn't want to listen to him because he was small. Um, and I wanted, um, and I realized through this work that I wasn't happy with the way I was contemporizing the, the figure, and I wanted Water Spider to be more realistic. I wanted it to be based on the actual spider that inspired this story. I eventually, I did contemporize the image, and so here are some versions that you'll see um, at the Longhouse exhibit, and um, a version of the prints I ended up making, the, the print blocks that will be part of a workshop through, through the Longhouse. And now I'm wondering about this water spider versus grandma spider. Um, I really, it was only a few years ago that I picked up a copy of Cherokee Stories that was meant for children and read this story. Um, I love the spider bringing fire story and she was called water spider. I looked for more versions and in every version I found she was called water spider. But when I went to the Cherokee homecoming art show in Tahlequah and I talked to people about water spider, all excited, you know, I noticed that people were very uh, deliberate and polite to sort of rephrase, oh yes, grandma spider. Well, this is sort of tickling the back of my mind, you know, why is this? Why, um, yeah, she's an important elder and calling her gra grandmother or grandma is respectful and appropriate, but is there another reason, okay? Meanwhile, I'm chunking out spiders, right? I'm making spiders, I need to learn this form. Well, I started digging into that written record. I was like, why, why is this? Why is there this discrepancy? And I discovered that uh, the, the primary written record of the story was, was transcribed by a fellow named James Mooney. He's very famous as an anthropologist um, in the early 1900s. And he published a book called The Myths of the Cherokee in 1902 where he interviewed elders um, actually in the hills of Tennessee. So people who had hidden from the Indian removal and so were considered to have maybe the, the most direct line to their original heritage, the most um, native Cherokee speakers. So he did try his best to, to get a, um, as close to an original version of the story as he could. And in that story, he names the grandma spider character, and I am not gonna pronounce this correctly, Kanaski Amaye. 
that literally trans translates as water spider. Kanasuke is a spider. And then Amai, by itself, is water. But when you go back to this 1902 publication, you'll see that the storyteller uses these words in Cherokee, okay, but stops the story and clarifies, quote, this is not the water spider that looks like a mosquito, but the other one, hmm, with black downy hair and red stripes on her body. So here's a picture of an actual water spider. They're semi-aquatic. They always have long legs. They don't have um, noticeably um, hairy, downy hair, right? And they never have eyes on the top of their head. That's not their environment. They're looking ahead. All of their eyes are on this plane. Um, so what's going on here? Who was Grandma Spider? Again, if we look at these ancient artifacts, we see a character that has stocky legs, thick stocky legs. In some of them, um, thick hair is depicted. Uh, they have these stripes on the legs that are added and these extra, um, extra marks on, the, on her abdomen to indicate this color. And they always have eyes on the top of their head, similar to this spider here. This is a jumping spider. Was Grandma Spider actually a jumping spider? And in fact, when I started looking at what spiders had this kind of morphology or this kind of um, coloring and shaping in the traditional lands of the Cherokee, I found this spider, Phidippus Johnsoni, is a jumping spider that was endemic, is endemic to the, the traditional homelands of the Cherokee. It fits both the visual and the oral description. So it's it's got the stocky legs, it's got the proportions, it has the colors different. Um, of course, spiders are individuals just like people, and some of them have more striping. In fact, the males have more striping on their legs than the females. <laughs> like birds, right, they're more colorful. Um, they're native to the homelands, and in one post, someone who loves arachnids, they said they have this unusual ability, not normal in jumping spiders, where they walk on water by scissoring their hind legs. Well, my mind is blown, okay? My mind is blown. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's who Grandma Spider was based on, okay? This whole water spider thing, I think, is a misattribution. Um, but what's more, being here, I go onto a Facebook group. I find, let's see, I wrote down the exact group because I want to give these people credit. The Cherokee Language for Second Language Learners Facebook group. And I said, hey, I love this character. I love this story. Does anyone know what her name is in Cherokee? And I had two different elders chime in. In both cases, her name is this Distoldi. And one of them even specifies that it means Oh, I put this image over it a little bit. Um, that, that their um, legs mimic scissors. So distoldi um, can be in scissor or scissoring action. And remember this jumping spider has this very unusual ability to walk on water by scissoring, making a scissoring action with its legs. When we think about, and this is a little bit of a detour perhaps for this talk, but for me it's, it's part of it's part of the inspiration of pushing forward to make this sculpture because when we think about the power of language to shape culture, I look up Distoldi in, in online Cherokee dictionaries and when I look up the phonetic in Cherokee, it comes back as both scissors and water spider, okay? So it's being recognized that this that this original name for this character, this really important character, does mean scissors, but it also means in capital letters, water spider. And then if I go the opposite direction and I search for water spider, I just get one answer, distoldi. Um, I question the etymology of this and I would love for a true scholar <laughs> to perhaps feel inspired to do the actual research on this. Um, the etymology being the origin of a word. In this case, I believe that water spider is not in any way related to distoldi. 
spider in Cherokee, okay? Spider in Cherokee is Kanagesi. In general, water is Ama. Here's the, what that elder named her, right? Water spider. Um, if you're going to, if water spider is not her real name, if water spider is only her name because someone couldn't remember her name and said it wrong, then that should be, um, that should be acknowledged and that attribution should be made, in my opinion, in the dictionaries and, um, and a shift in the vernacular, in the understanding of our own culture. So just to get an idea of um, primary source. So in my opinion, the primary source is back 1000 AD, the, the shell etchings of Grandma Spider. 540 years later, first European contact. So at this point, 1540, um, cultural erosion is starting to happen. 290 years after that, after um, the first European contact, was the Indian removal, the, which we commonly know as the Trail of Tears, as far as the Cherokee people are concerned. And then 72 years after that, so after the removal, was when James Mooney interviewed this elder and, um, and wrote, wrote her name as, as Water Spider. So you can understand how this elder might have lost touch with or forgotten um, her original name. And then if you think about from the Indian Removal Act to today, that's been almost 200 years. And so now we're trying to reacquire our language. And um, in present day, Cherokee language dictionaries, common vernacular, continue to likely misattribute Distoldi as water spider. So that's kind of like a secondary obsession that I've discovered. So now I feel like I know who she is. I know her name is Distoldi. I have rediscovered this character. I've rediscovered Grandma Spider, and I start interpreting her through magical realism. I have a realistic spider, but it's magically larger than it would be, and it, you know, it's able to do things that, that perhaps a, a real spider can't do. So here's my first um, maquette using magical realism um, with this realistic looking um, jumping spider put in a wheel as a way of, um, of mounting. So I'm trying to figure out how to get this sculpture mounted in a public sculpture. That's my ultimate goal. And at this point, I still think I need to make this thing out of concrete. Okay. Here's my second maquette. So I went from this six inch maquette to this foot and a half maquette of, of the water spider, again in its own wheel, um, suspended in a web. Um, and in this case, I'm able to put a, a red piece of glass to represent the ember. So outdoor sculptures have got their own constraints. A ceramic sculpture can't withstand the rain, heat, freezing temperatures experienced by a public sculpture. Concrete sculptures can withstand the elements. Bronze is the gold standard of public sculptures, like these fellows sitting on the steps here. But could this concept be done in bronze? All or in part. So now I've got to learn about bronze. Um, an article from the Crucible describes bronze casting as, quote, bronze casting is the process of pouring molten bronze into a hollow mold to create a positive bronze sculpture or object. Methods of bronze casting like lost wax, ceramic shell, sand casting are used to produce bronze sculptures, instruments, metals, tools, plaques, and more. So to summarize, the way you get a bronze sculpture is the artist creates a pattern, but now it's commonly done with 3D printing. So a bronze sculpture might not have ever had an artist touch any part of it. So um, some kind of pattern is um, somebody else makes a mold of that. Somebody else mounts the alloy. Somebody else pours the mold. Okay, okay, if you're really into it, you could do all of this yourself. Don't get me wrong. But let's face it, somebody else is doing 90% of this of any sculpture you've ever seen. They remove the casting from the mold and they do all the finishing, all the filing, polishing, washing, cutting away the casting gates, all the fine tuning of this sculpture. So how can I accomplish bronze? I've got this complex spider form with all these undercuts, 
Um, it's very difficult and expensive to have it cast in bronze. I got a quote for just the body of the spider that said it would start at $10,000 for something just about the size of your two fists. I can't afford that. I mean, I don't have the commission, right? I'm just trying to propose a commission. Um, secondly, bronze casting, for me, I don't like the feeling of that. It takes the finishing work away from the artist and puts it in the hands of these hired artisans. But I've done bead work, right? I've, done, I've worked with these fiddly beads, and I get magazines and catalogs, and there's a product called bronze clay in these things. It's, it's sold to make jewelry. So the question is, can bronze clay be adapted to a larger and more robust sculpture? It can, and in fact, I'm too cheap to buy it, so I made it myself. It only takes three ingredients. You do have to find the right atomized metal powder, so you can make different kinds of quote clay, right? Silver, silver clay was the first product that was available commercially, but um, bronze clay is just a mixture of copper and tin. You need an organic binder. I tested three different organic binders, recipes that I found online. Um, all of them worked, right? All of them turned into solid bronze in the end, but only one of them was sculptable. And deionized water. Put it together right, you got bronze clay. So I started by doing a test sculpture. Um, one of them I did cards thick. So the other thing about this product or this material is that it's typically used for um, jewelry and all the information is about very thin, small things and measured in playing cards thick. So um, I did, I was able to sculpt it with the shell of the head four cards thick, um, but that, uh, it, I couldn't attach it to anything. I couldn't, um, I couldn't finish the sculpture that way. So I also did one as a pinch pot. It's only, in real life, it's only slightly smaller. And this is in the exhibit, actually. This pinch pot um, version is in the exhibit. Um, I found, let's see. I found like a trade paper, sort of like somebody's doctoral dissertation or something, um, where they, um, they described how to fire it because that was the other thing. All the information online was for cards thick, you know, like maybe four to six cards thick. So how do you fire something that's, in this case, as much as a quarter inch thick? And if you fire that and get it to work and turn into bronze, is that gonna mess up the thin parts, right? You've got thick and thin parts. Um, so I found this paper and it had a firing schedule and we tested it and it worked. So here's the first grandma spider sculpture that I completed. Um, it was made in three parts. So the, the head and the abdomen were made separately and the pot for her ember and then they were joined. Um, the legs are completely separate. And then there's a hollow post inside her abdomen so that she can be mounted in her um, large steel sculpture. There's also a ring on her abdomen so that her legs can be attached and articulated after firing. To fire the clay into solid bronze, first you fire it to completely dry the material. Then you've got a second firing to burn off the organic binder. Now it's super fragile. Then the third firing, um, they call it sintering. You center the material into solid bronze in a strict reduction atmosphere. So if you're a ceramics geek, this will make sense to you. Um, bronze is extremely reactive with oxygen, and so it has to be fired um, without, oops, without oxygen in an oxygen-starved atmosphere in order for it to center into solid bronze. So this spider that you see here, I actually misfired and it carbonized. And that's, this is the spider that is in the display here at the Longhouse. Um, however, I refired it correctly and it turned into solid bronze, so all was not lost. Um, you need a sagger box, either of stainless steel or ceramic, filled with activated carbon. So the activated carbon then eats up any of the oxygen that was in that box with it quickly so that the rest of the firing schedule can happen without oxygen. Um, and I used um, a programmable kiln. And so with a programmable kiln, you can um, specify how, you, how quickly you want to ramp your temperature up to the final temperature and in what increments, and then how long to hold it there so that it can finish turning into that solid bronze. 
I got to learn the rudiments of welding and blacksmithing. So I, I made this, um, this web by pounding metal rods on, um, on an anvil and, and welding them together. And then the welding department here at Peninsula College fabricated the base. Um, and I want to make sure I say nice things. I think a student named Ethan is the one who cut and fabricated the, the pyramid base. And there might have been a second student that I didn't catch their name. Kelly um, prepped and cut the ring with a plasma torch. And Bree attached the ring to the, to the pyramid. And that's how the final sculpture was made. Um, it's currently installed at the Fine Arts Center. I do have a list of references, um, including the YouTube videos I used to figure out how to make the, the clay and the, what is it called? Technical troubleshooting information on firing. Wado, thank you very much. That's my presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so Karen has generously offered to have a time here for discussion, and I'll also take some questions from Zoom. And if you need to leave, if you're a student who need, you know, and you need to leave, of course, leave when you need to. Um, but we invite you all to stay for a while and, and have conversation. And on the music stand in the back, you'll, you'll find some flyers for a workshop. And so what else, that if you would like to ask a question, then Karen will repeat the question and answer it for the folks in Zoom to, to hear your question. So we can get started. Any questions? I see someone in the, in the back. Um, how much of your life, how many years, or, um, from the time you got interested and till you ended up with all of this visual art, um, it seems like a big chunk of your life. Yeah, it was, it was a whole four months. Yeah, I accomplished this in four months. Well, I was able to get the sculpture made and then um, much of the ceramics that sort of support it um, were done in the three months after that. I guess I mean getting fascinated with the story and all of everything that made you so obsessed with it. Yeah, four months. I guess I had heard the story um, actually six months prior to that. So I had heard it in the summer of 2022. And then I got the open call in December of 22. And the sculpture was completed. Well, maybe the sculpture was actually completed by, um, by June. Of, of, am I getting the dates right of 23? No, all of it's a year back. So I picked up the story in June of 21, heard about it, the sculpture in December of 21 had a sculpture installed by June of 22. Yeah. One quick question from Zoom. Sure. Um, as opposed to $10,000, what was the final cost? Oh, I have no idea. Um, it probably cost, so if I think about what I had to pay in order to have access to the studio and to the expertise, of people here on campus and the materials. And then if you were to think about my time, it, it cost a minimum of $5,000 just in, in raw time and materials, which is how the $10,000 price tag was decided on. Yeah. Oh, so the question is, what materials, how did I decide on the materials to use for the ember? And I've got to give kudos to Steve Bells again, because I was glibly going along, just assuming I could order a glass orb from a glass blower that my family knows, um, who works in Seattle. And thank goodness Steve said to me, hey, have you sourced that orb? Because you're almost done and you've got to install it, you know, in a month. And I'm like, yeah, I've got a whole month. I'm just going to ask. 
I can't remember his name right now that I'm on stage. Um, I'm just going to ask him to make it out of glass. And um, come to find out, it's not so easy because, for one thing, it's not that big. It's, it, it's actually um, three centimeters in diameter to fit in that little pot. And um, glass, okay, in order to make glass red, you have to put air in it because it, the, the colors that you use in glass look black um, when they're condensed. So you have to put air in it. And I don't want air in it because I want it to be a public sculpture that's robust to the environment and to vandals. But secondly, if you think about how big the gather of glass is on the punty of a glass blower's punty, right? How are you gonna get air in, in an orb that size? And Dave, Dave is the glass blower's name. I wanna ask my mom his last name and I can't think of it right now. Um, he actually tried to do it. He experimented with a few different like experimental techniques. Anyway, it wasn't possible, so thank goodness for Amazon. Because Amazon, I was able to find a company in Southern California that you can custom order crystal shapes from. So I was able to specify the size I needed, and because the color is incorporated into the molecular structure of the crystal, you can accomplish different colors um, in crystal that you can't in glass. <laughs> Does that answer it? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I almost lost it at the last minute. I had to come up with an alternate plan. So then I order it, right? But they were making it for me. And they gave me uh, a month long delivery window. So the, the first possible day it could be delivered was the day before I had already agreed to have it installed at the Fine Arts Center. So I was like, well, I better come up with an alternate plan because chances are this thing isn't going to arrive. So I had this alternate plan of using a glue gun and like the glass that you use in your flower vase. Yeah, to sort of temporarily put some red glass in there until the crystal came and then I could permanently, you know, sort of install the, the crystal. So that uh, astute question, I didn't even plant that question in the audience. It, that was a bigger problem than, than you might have guessed. Yeah. Yes, question in the front. This is, this is really a beautiful story. Oh, um, thank you. Have you done any other artwork in your life, or is this like something that inspired you and, and you just took charge? So the question is, have I done other artwork in my life, or is this something that inspired me? I have done other artwork. I started in ceramics, and I first became obsessed with teapots. I actually spent three years of uh, working as a school teacher in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and making only teapots. So that was back in the early 2000s. And then um, I just stopped doing teapots altogether. I got, I got to where I could make a teapot anytime, and I guess I wasn't interested. Nobody was buying them, you know? I mean, I still have <laughs> many teapots in boxes. Um, so I started with teapots and ceramics, and but that wasn't really a lot of hand building, and I sort of just frittered around, and then um, I guess it was 20, between 2012 and 2014, I was going, I went back to school in Illinois, and they had just retired their native mascot, named Chief Olenowick, but it was still a huge controversy on campus. And I was sort of recruited to be part of the Native American house, sort of like the student, student group support center. And the students were like, what we really need is we really need for people to understand why this mascot is so offensive, because people couldn't understand, they thought they were being respectful by having this person um, perform at games in different places. And it was really offensive. So he, this, this mascot person, the school at some point had purchased an authentic Plains Indian, probably Lakota Sioux, um, fully beaded regalia and war bonnet. Um, and that's what this person wore. And so that was really offensive to the few students. I mean, I used to joke, you know, the Native American students were you and me, you know, both of us are there. Um, it was really offensive to the few students who came from that culture, but also f for people who also had um, more experience with, um, with, with regalia. 
So we decided we need to have a beading workshop. If people could learn how, how difficult and time consuming it was to do that beading, then they would understand better. That would be a way of giving them an authentic Native American experience, um, but also then have that, that um, understanding. Well, nobody knew how to bead, and neither did I. But I said, well, I'll, I'll learn. I like doing artsy stuff. So anyway, so I made this jacket. <laughs> this, was, this was my first beading project. It's supposed to be Andrew Jackson with a Hitler mustache, <laughs> right? Because he's the one that signed the Indian Removal Act. Yeah, good times. Um, and I, and I learned how to do these different kinds of beading and we sponsored these workshops and, and that's, so that was my sort of second foray. And then, and then I, um, I made some different pieces that I got into the Cherokee art market. And, um, but I kept teaching, you know, I was teaching middle school. So I didn't really have enough time to, to devote to it. So just little by little I was doing beaded sculpture really. And then when I um, retired from teaching and moved here to be close to my family, I got into ceramics again. And Grandma Spider pulled me into her web of wonder and fabulousness. Yeah. Susie? Do you know what's next? Are you gonna continue on the spider theme or do something else? So the question is, do I know what's next? Am I going to continue on the spider theme? I, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to ditch the Spider Woman um, moniker, but I've already, um, I've got a, a, an amazing chess set that I sculpted all the different pieces and um, will hopefully have in the Cherokee, no, in the Santa Fe Indian market, cr fingers crossed. I do a lot of, um, I've got several pieces that um, are commentary on, um, what would be the nice way to say it? It really bothers me the way that tobacco, which, um, has been sacred to all of our people here in the Americas for so long and in the Cherokee tradition was an extremely strong medicine, how that has been um, bastardized to a, a, a death dose. So I've got multiple pieces that have to, so I've got like a, if you've ever seen the American Spirit cigarette packet, it's got a person in sort of like a war bonnet and stuff. So I've got a, a necklace that says un-American spirit and he's smoking a cigarette, you know, he's got his eyes blacked out. So. Um, I do, need, I do need a big inspiration. So the political issues, like the Andrew Jackson thing, um, I try to find humor so that people are able to access the information so that they're not instantly um, offended, but they're able to sort of laugh and say, hey, what's this about? And then maybe they're able to then um, adjust their thinking or realize that there's a different way of seeing this thing um, that, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> that, could, that could maybe change the social consciousness around it in a good way. So no, I'm not gonna stick with only spider. In fact, I've already done a few sculptures for the water beetle because I'm really into that dude. Um, and I don't know where I'm gonna go with the process. Question over here. So the question is, what happened with this proposal? Is it moving to Tahlequah? And um, the answer is, it's not moving to Tahlequah. So the, with the proposal, the proposal, so this sculpture is actually sort of um, a, um, a draft of the monumental scale version that I proposed. So the monumental scale version, so this one is seven feet tall. The monumental scale, the pyramid alone would be eight feet. And so then the ring with the spider would be stepped up um, to instead of one and a half feet, like, or two and a half feet to like three and a half feet. So the proposal has not been denied. <laughs> it hasn't been accepted, but it has not been denied. And so far they have done temporary installations in this space. So there have been two temporary installations in that space so far. And um, I, I have hope that it will still be accepted. Uh, Sage. Do you have any plans of using other types of metal clay in the future, like the silver or anything like that? 
So the question is, do I have plans to use other types of metal clay in the future like silver? Um, so silver and gold don't, don't turn me on. Um, like bronze and copper. So copper is, is very um, traditional for, for Cherokee, um, sort of like the pre-Columbian metal of, of choice um, for the Cherokee people. So, and it's very similar to bronze in that um, bronze is, you know, anywhere from eight to 10% tin and the rest copper. And they have similar um, firing requirements, they have to be fired in that strict reduction atmosphere. So silver, you can actually fire with a torch. So you don't have to, to have the same atmosphere. And I don't like it, I don't, the precious metals, for one thing, they're so expensive. Um, and I, I have made a bunch of jewelry, but I, it's not really my love. It's more of something to have as a product when I go to an art show so that people can, um, can access my art without having to spend $10,000. So no, I don't think I'll do anything in silver or gold unless I had a collaboration with another artist. So I did have a mentor, um, Cherokee artist, Tony Chuliwa, who unfortunately passed away last summer. And we had all kinds of plans for collaborating different types of, um, of jewelry and, and, and decorative items. So something like that could, could happen, that I, I would uh, embrace that idea. But I don't think I'm going to go into um, into precious metals myself. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? There's a lot of support on Zoom and a lot of thank you and so oh, forth. So we'll, we'll share that chat with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh. Any any more questions in here? No. <laughs> Well, I really thank you all for being here and for supporting me in, um, in sharing my artistic process. And I hope that you can come to the Longhouse to look at the exhibit that's there. And Wado, thank you. <laughs>